Sir Charan Singh. Uh, he has been the pioneering and the mastermind behind this web, uh, this webinars, and uh, he has been uh, taking it uh, head on uh, right for last 220 or 225 webinars we have done without interruption, and that is a credit goes to him. And today we are uh, going to discuss a very very important topic: economy of Tamil Nadu. And Tamil Nadu is on the right in, in more than one uh, way. And uh, our today's session um, chair is uh, Professor N. R. Bhanumurthy. Uh, Professor Bhanumurthy is currently the director of Madras School of Economics, Chennai. Earlier, he had served as the first vice chancellor of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar School of Economics University. Uh, Bengaluru based university as many people call it. He also had a long stint as professor in NIF, NIPF uh, P and New Delhi as assistant professor, later associate uh, professor at IEG also. His research areas are macro monetary economics, fiscal policy, international money and finance, macroeconomic modeling and development economics. In these areas, he had authored over 90 five books and over 250 short articles in newspaper and magazine. His views on Indian economy is very regularly uh, quoted in both print and visual media. He was a visiting fellow at MSH Paris, Medgal University, Montreal and ADP Manila. He has been a con uh, consultant to UN DESA, New York, UNISCWA, Beirut, and UNDP Nepal, UNDP Bhutan, Un UNICEF, uh, ILO, World Bank, and ADP. He also served as over 25 government committee constituted by Finance Ministry, Ministry of Statistics, Ministry of Rural Development, National Statistical Commission, Ministry of Education. List is in fact very long, and including Planning Commission and Niti Aayog, RBIS. Uh, SEBI and so on so forth. So, and he also in recent times, he has as a part of India G20 presidency, Dr. Banu Murthy is uh, nominated as a chair for the T20 task force one on macroeconomic trade and livelihood. And I am grateful to him for consenting, having consented to chair this session. So thank you very much, Professor Banu Murthy. Now, I will turn my attention to Professor Suresh Babu. He is a director of Madras Institute of Development Study. He was a faculty member of Department of Humanities in IIT Madras. He also held position at CDS Trivendra, where me and my, my good friend, Professor Charan Singh, have studied. So we have very, very interesting and very unforgettable memory of CDS Trivendra. And this is a one way we share our uh, common interest. There are many other reasons also, but this is one of them. So, and he has also served at Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, Pune Institute for Social and Economic Change, Bengaluru, and has been a visiting faculty in various institutions in India and abroad. His area of research interests are applied macroeconomics, institutional economics, trade and development. He was consultant to ADB and to World Bank. He is a member of WTO Forum and on non-agriculture sector, Government of Kerala in 2003. He holds PhD from JNU. Uh, professor S. Rajendran is a senior professor and head Department of Economics, Gandhi Gram Rural Institute. He has 34 years in research and 24 years in teaching experience. In fact, very rich experience. He has authored over 39 papers and 24 in teaching, uh, sorry, uh, 39 papers in edited volume, pro proceeding 142 numbers of publication in international and national journal, and four policy notes, four books, and and uh, he has been uh, director in charge of Pride, Periyar University, syndicate member of Periyar University, chairman board of examination, University of Mysore, and chairman and member coordinator of NAAC Bengaluru. He holds PhD, MPhil and MPhil. Now, last but not the least is Professor Prashant Kumar Panda. 
who is a professor and director uh, in the department of economics at pondicherry university uh, previously he was professor and head of economics professor in charge at central university of tamil nadu his research focuses on public economics fiscal policy decentralization states fiscal management applied statistics econometrics and health economics panda has taught at various institution including government pondicherry the colleges odisha university of agriculture and technology and biju patnaik university of technology he, he has extensive work uh, extensive administrative experience having founded and coordinated the departments of economics education and history panda has been a professor in charge of academics and academic coordinator he has published 47 research paper and edited and co-edited four books he is the editor of a uh, vision journal of indian taxation and has presented at 47 conferences and delivered talks at 55 event he holds phd in economics from pondicherry university so i now uh, the floor is uh, of the chairman uh, Uh, professor ns uh, nr bhanumurthy uh, the format is each speaker will talk about 15 to 20 minutes then we leave last few uh, 7 to 10 minutes for the q and a so uh, it is over to you and uh, once again uh, we are delighted to have each one of you uh, on this platform professor bhanumurthy Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ashok Vishendras. It's a pleasure to uh, be part of this Ecro uh, event. Um, uh, Dr. Charan Singh has been asking me to be part of this for quite some time, but now only I could get this opportunity. Thank you so much, and let me also thank my good friend uh, Dr. Charan Singh for uh, uh, inviting me to this. Uh, being a moderator is a very easy job, uh, and. Uh, Uh, and uh, having three distinguished speakers is in fact it's much more easier for the moderator to moderate the session and um, uh, as uh, dr vishan ashok vishan has pointed out this is part of the um, a series of um, state seminars uh, that have been uh, organized by igro foundation for the past one month or so and also some the main uh, 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 what to say objective of these seminars is that you know to learn uh, best practices across the states and uh, you know how one can really uh, improve the domestic uh, state domestic policies and i think toward the end uh, uh, these series of seminars are actually very useful i heard couple of uh, state seminars particularly uh, haryana and uh, telangana and i think they are all very useful and uh, we will be following a similar uh, uh, structure of um, discussion today as well and uh, in terms of uh, tamil nadu economy i think uh, uh, as we all know tamil nadu has been one of the um, uh, traditionally uh, better performing state uh, in addition to uh, maharashtra gujarat and um, uh, karnataka and andhra pradesh Uh, Tamil Nadu has been a traditionally better performing states, and if you look at any of the indicators, whether you talk about macro indicators or you talk about social indicators, I think Tamil Nadu has been extremely well uh, for the past uh, uh, three to four decades. Uh, so there are few indicators which I thought let me float uh, float for the discussion. And if you look at the per capita income of the state of Tamil Nadu, and uh, if you look at for the for the last year. i think the tamil nadu per capita income is somewhere close to 2.5 lakh compared to all india per capita income of just about 1.5 lakh that means there is a tamil nadu economy is comes somewhere in the top uh, in terms of the list of states uh, with respect to uh, per capita income and um, even if you will take um, um, you know the the balanced growth that we talk about i think the balanced growth can be seen in the state of tamil nadu where you do have although the share of agriculture sector is declining but i think all the three sectors agriculture industry and services appears to be doing extremely well uh, and uh, i don't need to speak much about industrial uh, industry in tamil nadu i mean i can give you just one small example um, uh, you know 
for the past three four years uh, india is going towards electrical vehicles i think in that tamil nadu is the pioneer and i'm, I'm sure all of you know that whole electrical vehicles actually comes from the state of tamil nadu as we speak today uh, ford is actually coming back just now i see that uh, ford company has a letter of intent to the state of tamil nadu to restart the production process in in the state of tamil nadu so in that sense we do see a lot of companies coming into tamil nadu and also particularly the foreign companies actually coming into tamil nadu for for uh, the production aspects uh, in terms of the social sector um, if you look at the old indian textbooks i think tamil nadu has always been highlighted as a a typical welfare state you know uh, where there's so much focus was on the welfare of the citizens and uh, there are many instances or many best practices that have been scaled up across the country and one of them is uh, the midday meal scheme which was started in as early as you know 1970s and that has become uh, certainly a best practice across the country in fact recently the government of tamil nadu also started a breakfast scheme and i think the, all these things actually gives you a nice um, you know for an economist like us it will give you a nice relationship between the public policy intervention and also um, you know enrollment ratio that we talk about at the education level so there is a very positive and direct relationship between uh, public policy intervention like this and, uh, and the, some of the social sector outcomes like uh, grass enrollment ratio or literacy all these are really related so i'm not going to speak much about it um, uh, because we have three very eminent speakers uh, maybe i'll request uh, professor uh, suresh babu to start his presentation and i think he's going to speak on the macro and industrial aspects of tamil nadu so look forward to listening to professor suresh babu thank you thank you professor vanamurthy and uh, thank you egro for this opportunity to speak about uh, tamil nadu's economy uh, well uh, as professor banamurthy was uh, discussing if we have to talk about tamil nadu economy then i think we need many sessions one is not enough because there are various facets of tamil nadu and each of it is fascinating yeah i always uh, recollect the uh, saying by robert lucas that when you start uh, thinking about growth you can't think about anything else so once when you start thinking about the trajectory of growth that tamil nadu has taken over the last 25 years then we have different aspects to discuss but for today i will uh, uh, discuss a very narrow kind of a, of a, a growth aspects and try and draw some kind of you know uh, inferences from the uh, growth of tamil nadu economy yeah uh, is my uh, slide visible yes 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 thank you um now let me let me start with an overview well second largest contributor among states to the gdp um maharashtra contributes 13% and tamil nadu 8.78 and then comes karnataka uttar pradesh gujarat well one could actually debate these numbers because there are very minor small That's point differences but on the whole the contribution of tamil nadu uh, to india's gdp is very high and two uh, important things we need to note in this context that is the top five states in india contribute to around 46% of total economy and the five southern states <clears throat> account for 31%. So this is where we have to situate or locate Tamil Nadu's growth performance. Okay. Now, uh, when we look at Tamil Nadu's economy, as uh, Professor Banumurthy was talking, it's a very vibrant economy in terms of growth rates as well as diversification. Now, if you look at Tamil Nadu's uh, GSDP, it grew at 8.2 percentage in 22-23. Yeah, as high or as as good or as you know bad as the Indian economy. And the unique feature is that 
all the three sectors have, have registered more than 4% rate of growth. Yeah, basically agriculture, manufacturing, as well as services. Now, uh, the contribution of each sectors are also very interesting to note, and that is where perhaps, you know, the national uh, economy can draw some lessons. Manufacturing and industry contributes to nearly 30, more than 30%, 34% to the economy. Yeah, and that is almost double of what we see at the national level, 17 to 18% is what we see. Yeah, in terms of per capita GSDP, Tamil Nadu's per capita GSDP is also very high and it is also growing. So this is the overall growth picture that we see. Now, uh, when we look at Tamil Nadu's economy's growth in phases, we find that there are two very distinct phases. Yeah. One phase is the period from 2005-06 to 2011-12. Yeah. When Tamil Nadu's economy registered a very robust growth performance of close to 10.3 percentage. And the next phase is from 2012-13 to 21-22 or 22-23, where we find that the growth actually declined. Yeah. So these are two very distinct phases. Now, I, I should uh, 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 upfront state that uh, this is not based on any, you know, uh, time series test or whatever that we do generally on time series in terms of uh, structural breaks or something. But just a plot of the growth rates would reveal that there are two phases. What is more interesting is that in the second phase, we find that Tamil Nadu's economy is also showing fluctuations in the rate of growth. That is, it is more volatile. And if you look at a trend rate of growth that is, you know, generated through a filter or whatever we do, uh, we find that the growth rate has declined in the second period quite considerably, which means that there is a kind of a, a slowdown compared to the first phase. Yeah. And this is characteristic of most of the states, except for a, a few uh, states in India. But there are two features that really stands out or distinguish Tamil Nadu economy. One is the state has always been one of the foremost industrialized states in the country, a long history of industrialization. Yeah? Contribution, as I told, of, of industry is more than 30%. State accounted for the most number of factories in you know, certain years, for example, in 2018-19, according to SI. Yeah? And Second important feature that we need to keep in mind is that, according to the 2011 census, Tamil Nadu is the third most urbanized state after, you know, Goa and Mizoram. So, you know, it's the most urbanized state, big state, yeah, with around 48.4% of the population living in urban areas. So, now we have an idea of the, of the uh, growth of this economy, and this is what I was talking about. Yeah, this is the period that I was referring to in the second phase, that is from 2011, 12 to 13, we find that Tamil Nadu's growth rate has, has declined marginally compared, or not marginally, compared to the earlier period, uh, substantial decline, but more or less in, in, in line with the other big economies in terms of, you know, Telangana or other economies. And here we also find that the, uh, uh, in terms of current prices, GSDP of Tamil Nadu has also grown. Okay. And this is the point that I was talking about the sectoral growth rates, right? And we find that uh, agriculture has uh, exhibited a kind of a volatility, which is, is quite high. And uh, whereas uh, the, the blue line, that is the secondary sector, uh, tends to slow down from a period of 2016-17 to 2021 when the COVID hit. And from there, we find a revival path and services has been uh, registering uh, steady rate of growth. And in terms of the contribution, now again, uh, to reiterate this point that uh, unlike a lot of other models that we talk about, yeah, models, you know, two prominent models that come to our mind, uh, the Gujarat model of industrialization and the Kerala model of human development, Tamil Nadu has a unique model. And that unique model is a model with two sectors really driving the economy, that is ma the manufacturing or the industrial sector as well as the service sector. Why I say this is that once when we look at Gujarat, we find that the services is not as vibrant as other, other uh, uh, states. 
And once when we look at Kerala, we know that the industrial sector is not vibrant. So this, both these so-called models have their own weak links, but Tamil Nadu is unique in, in that sense because it is not only industrial sector, but also service sector that is actually fueling growth. What is the net outcome of this in terms of, of uh, uh, growth? We get the first kind of a reflection of this in terms of total exports. Yeah, and we find that the share of Tamil Nadu is consistently high when we talk about the uh, uh, total exports from India. Yeah, always more than 8.5 percentage, yeah? and in some years hitting 10 percentage. And we we also find that except for the COVID hit period, the merchandise exports from Tamil Nadu has been growing at a, a steady pace. So that is that is something which is which is very important, and that to me would be the kind of a synergy between the growth of industrial sector as well as services sector. Again, we find that this whole, you know, industry services synergy, which is evident in Tamil Nadu, also results in terms of high investment rates. Professor Banamurthy was talking about Ford returning. It is not only Ford that if we look at uh, the auto industries landscape in India, it is basically shaped by Tamil Nadu. Yeah, I don't want to reel out names in terms of the big giants, but in terms of auto industry, we find that majority or the world's big players are all in Tamil Nadu. Yeah, just to give you an idea, Ford had, has two plants. Hopefully, they will revive Hyundai, Nissan, Renault, BMW. Mahindra, Mahindra, Daimler, Ashok Leyland, to Yamaha, Enfield, Caterpillar. So, so the, the point that I want to emphasize is that we find that there is a, a, a very vibrant industrial sector, which is reflected in the invested capital of industries. So then what are the growth drivers? Well, I, I started off by, uh, by saying that, well, uh, there is a vibrant service sector as well as a, a, a vibrant industrial sector. What is contributing to that? Well, infrastructure, of course, Tamil Nadu ranks first in terms of uh, domestic tourist arrivals in 2021, slightly dated, but still, I think it is, it is very high. But the more important thing is that Tamil Nadu is one of the first states in India to have 100% metal road connectivity. Yeah? So that gives you an idea of the infrastructure. Yeah? I'm not going to the ports as well as the other uh, kind of infrastructure, because when we look at ports, we find that there is, there is, you know, a, a very vibrant kind of a, a marine system that, or a network of marine system that is actually aiding the uh, exports from Tamil Nadu. Complementing this, we also find that there is a strong human resource pool. Yeah, highly qualified, uh, skilled, dis and very disciplined workforce. English-speaking human resource pool. Yeah, every year we turn out uh, close to. Uh, 1.5 lakh of engineers, and this is supplemented by polytechnics as well as uh, a number of other uh, technical training programs, which automatically results in in diversified industrial base. Yeah, in terms of number of factories as well as industrial workers, we know that you know some of the recent numbers show that 43% uh, of India's women manufacturing sector workers are from Tamil Nadu. Yeah. So that is the kind of a diversification that we are talking about. Along with that, there is a, a, a good kind of a, a substantial base for IT and ITES exports. So these are basically some of the growth drivers that we see when we talk about the growth of Tamil Nadu. But what is actually leading to this growth? And that is the point that I want to uh, emphasize. Well, I think the important thing is pragmatic policies that have led to. Yeah, for example, uh, the electronics hardware manufacturing policy of 2020 gives very, very specific emphasis to certain sectors. Yeah. And these sectors within the electronics hardware manufacturing is, you know, picked and these are promoted. So we find some very good examples of strategic interventions as far as industrial policy is concerned. Solar energy policy, I, I don't have to elaborate on that. Tamil Nadu's one of the early solar energy policies, yeah? and the idea is to reduce carbon emissions. MSME policy of 2021, 
well there's a lot of reforms that have come even after this but the idea is to create a kind of a synergy between the large and the medium and as well as the uh, small industries in the economy ict policy aerospace and industrial uh, defense industrial policy as well as the overall industrial policy which actually provides a, a a conducive framework so the point that i want to emphasize here is that we find that the policy landscape of tamil nadu is conducive in terms of attracting investments as well as promoting industrialization which is aided by the availability of skilled manpower as well as infrastructure now but if we if we take one step backwards for this kind of pragmatic policies you need a very clear vision from the government yeah and that is something which perhaps is a lesson that we can draw from tamil nadu one of the things that we find is that irrespective of the political parties that come to power in tamil nadu there is a sustained emphasis in terms of industrialization yeah? and this this is a very important aspect when we see tamil nadu if you look at some of the other states the first thing that a new government that comes to power is to undo the policies of the earlier government but in the case of tamil nadu what we find is that there is a kind of a continuity so it's a it's a very interesting mix of change with continuity as far as public policies are concerned and that is evident when we look at infrastructure policies policies for growth investment as well as the last point is very important that the public policies are tailor made to provide opportunities that is the public policies are to really bring in a, an element of inclusivity in the growth pattern yeah and the idea is to have a poverty free state with opportunities for productive and employment so so two important aspects we need to keep in mind that is we we find that there is a strategic element in terms of policy making two there is also a continuity element in terms of policy making and that is the point that i really want to emphasize in terms of the lessons that we could draw from tamil nadu's growth experience okay now having said that let me come to the weak spot yeah well uh, the weak spot at the moment and which could turn out to be a challenge as far as growth is concerned is going to be the state finances right we find that there is a weakening of the fiscal strength of the state finances yeah and it is not something that can be attributed to the covid shock or something of a single shock it has happened over a period of time and we find that own tax revenue to gsdp has declined yeah has declined from 7.92 percentage in 11-12 to 5.98 percentage in 19-20. Now, own non-tax revenue has also declined, which means that the government is facing some kind of a resource constraint. We know what is going to be the immediate outcome of this. The immediate outcome of this could be index to which I will come in a minute. Now, uh, this is the picture about revenue, and the, the point that I want to highlight here is that there is always optimistic own tax revenue projections in all budgets but the actual realization is less yeah so you you have the uh, revised estimates and the bees and the bees are always optimistic but re's and actual estimates are often low which means that government is actually struggling to find revenues but where are the revenues coming from well a, a lot of it is from you know the usual kind of excise duty and other other things which which i will i will uh, come to uh, yeah basically in terms of the uh, sale of uh, indian made foreign liquor and improved collections from some of the other uh, minor heads so it is important to note that there is also a decline in terms of the tax devolution from the finance commissions for tamil nadu because the formula for devolution for finance commissions which actually attributed weightages for population as well as for demographic performances worked unfavorably towards a lot of southern states including tamil nadu and that is basically seen in the uh, finances of tamil nadu which is partly offset by the increase in grants and when we look at uh, expenditure that is very important we find that a lot of of uh, expenditure or there is a very high share of committed expenditure and when we look at committed expenditure we find that it's basically uh, interest payments pensions and salaries and that is increasing now we know that kerala is facing a difficulty in terms of this very high share of committed expenditure 
Now, one of the warning signals that Tamil Nadu has to really, you know, take into account is that this pattern of expenditure without commensurate increase in revenues could actually land up in trouble. And, and the reper repercussion of that is found in capital expenditure because capital expenditure to GSDP ratio decline, which means that the generation of growth in the next time period of future years would be a kind of a problem unless we increase this capital expenditure. Now, two important uh, aspects we need to keep in mind when we talk about this uh, revenue mobilization as well as expenditure, that is the increase in deficits. And subsequently, we also find that outstanding liabilities are also increasing, which is getting reflected in the debt position. Though Tamil Nadu's debt ratio is well below the targeted or recommended ratios by the finance commissions, we find that the debt in terms of uh, actual quantum of debt is increasing over a period of time, which is a worrying trend. And that is getting reflected in terms of the outstanding liabilities. And this is the point that I was trying to make. So what is the weak link here? The weak link, of course, is public utilities. And, and here, like in a lot of other states, it is the electricity regulation that needs to be emphasized. And that is where perhaps there is a need for a lot of you know, reforms in terms of uh, reorganizing as well as revitalizing the public utilities are concerned. So in terms of, of uh, public finances, then the government has to look at, you know, curtailing subsidies as well as increasing the rate of return on invest investments, especially in the public sector investments that we are talking about. Okay. Now let me, let me come to the last point and I will, I will stop with that. There is also a kind of a problem that Tamil Nadu is facing that is along with this, you know, declining own, ta own tax revenues, there is also insufficient fund flow to Tamil Nadu from the center. And this is on two counts. One is when there is a natural disaster, Tamil Nadu gets very less. Yeah. For example, in last uh, year, 2023, we had two spells of disasters and Tamil Nadu sought close to 37,000 crores. And what we got was only 276 crores. So that's the gap that we are talking about. And this is a state that is, you know, hit by cyclones as well as depressions quite frequently. Sorry. Again, there is also a problem in terms of centrally sponsored schemes. Yeah. That is the center's contribution is quite less and Tamil Nadu, the state government will have to contribute more. And that is evident when we look at the Chennai Metro Rail project, a project which is, which has got clearance, but which is waiting for the union cabinet committee's approval and state government is spending in anticipation of the funds that might come from center, which means that the budget of the state is hit now. So there is an inordinate delay in terms of increased uh, uh, expenditure on the part of the state, which could actually result in reduced capital expenditure and hamper growth in the long run. Okay, so let me summarize my, uh, my arguments here. The, the point that I, I wanted to emphasize here is that Tamil Nadu offers a very interesting experience in terms of economic policies in two, in two uh, aspects. One, there is stability in economic policies. Irrespective of the political party that comes to power, there is a policy stability that is seen. Second, we also find that there is a conscious effort to balance between industrialization and the growth of service sector. The net result of that is to bring in inclusive social policies, as is evident in a lot of social indicators to which I am not going to at this moment. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Suresh Babu. It was fantastic to know that uh, um, Tamil Nadu uh, is quite different from uh, other states. And you brought in many specific uh, characters of Tamil Nadu economy. Uh, particularly, you said uh, growth is apolitical. I think uh, the growth in Tamil Nadu not only apolitical come to when it comes to state politics, but also comes to the national politics. I think I think that way they are apolitical in that sense. And you also brought in the issues related how you know um, as we talked about in the beginning how there is a balanced kind of a focus on both manufacturing and service sector, uh, and uh, how this. Um, Public policy has brought a lot of stability to the overall macro policies, 
uh, and, uh, and you also brought uh, very uh, in a, a limited way um, uh, in terms of um, the challenges, right? I think uh, Dr. Panda is going to speak about the fiscal uh, aspects, but I think you brought it very clearly that uh, going forward, Tamil Nadu economy is going to face a lot of fiscal challenges. And you also said that you know the fiscal marksmanship is really weak in Tamil Nadu, and I think that is same for many other states. Uh, so that the, the errors between the budgeted and the actual will be much bigger in many other states. Uh, if at all it's very close, it's only accidental in my view, um, even at the national level. So I think uh, they're all very important. Uh, but I thought uh, there are a couple of things which we'll come back later. Um, like any other state, even Tamil Nadu is also trying to focus on, uh, you know, that uh, one trillion, you know, that uh, slogan. Um, and they're focusing to achieve this one trillion by 2030. Maybe you can comment a little later. And uh, in terms of, um, um, uh, I think one more aspect which I thought uh, uh, I would like to know a little more, uh, what happened to the traditional sectors? I, I know Atomobile has done extremely well, but what happens to other sectors like textiles? And uh, you know, how this foreign competition is actually helping or not helping the Tamil Nadu industry is something that we may want to know maybe at the later stage. So now let me come to uh, Professor Rajendran, who is a, uh, a well-known agriculture economist uh, of the state of Tamil Nadu, and he has done extensive work on that. I, 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 can I request Professor Rajendran, Rajendran to uh, present his uh, views? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, very good evening, everybody. Honorable uh, uh, again, very pleasant. I like to start my presentation by saying that we can expect the uh, tremendous transformation from agriculture to manufacturing, from manufacturing to service sector. And we can have of a material resource, but unless until you have something on the plate, it is very difficult to survey. I think when we talk about the glamorous development in Tamil Nadu, I think there is a darker side of the situation, uh, at least in the form of uh, agriculture. Although we have uh, success stories with your agriculture, we do have serious flaws uh, as well as serious difficulties to take forward this uh, traditional sector in the years to come. And I do have uh, slides prepared and it is very comprehensive. And wherever possible, I will skip and wherever it is more relevant, I will uh, uh, emphasize on that. In fact, I have structured my paper in five or six sessions. Uh, I would like to present my presentation in two uh, dimensions. The first part takes us to understand what is happening to agriculture in agriculture sector in Tamil Nadu. And in the last section, I would like to address on the social development because as the chair was pointing out in the beginning, Tamil Nadu is a unique state in terms of implementing various welfare schemes and the, reaping the benefit from that. Therefore, I would like to touch upon a bit of that. Now, coming to the uh, agriculture, uh, as it is expected and it is argued, there has been a transformation yeah, is it uh, visible? The PPT is uh, visible there, Professor yes, Bhagavati? Yes, yes, visible. Yes, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, let us move on to the next one. And uh, um, here, as it is happening in many parts of the world, uh, from traditional agriculture to modern agriculture, and then from modern agriculture to manufacturing sector, from manufacturing to service sector. These two, is these two are happening not only in Tamil Nadu, but also in India as well. As we could see from the previous presentation, there has been consistent decline in agriculture in terms of the contribution of agriculture share to total GDP over the years. And uh, there has been marginally, only marginal increase on manufacturing as well as the service sector. This is what uh, I would like to register here at this moment when we talk about the economic transition in Tamil Nadu. 
and followed by that uh, we do have a kind of painful situation within the agriculture sector where next time next slide where the uh, uh, performance in various segments of within the cropping system as well as the total contribution to economy has been on the decline if you see for example the growth rates of agriculture uh, it declined from 4.2% to 3.7% within short span of time and the total food grain also reduced considerably from 2.9 to 2% and the overall coarse cereals what we call it as uh, minor millers registered a negative growth and while the major cereals including rice uh, declined considerably from 3.7 to 2.2% trend in terms of aggregate production as of uh, individual crops as well as the total share of uh, agriculture to total economy with regard to uh, with regard to the uh, uh, performance of agriculture within tamil nadu the share to place uh, the decline of share to place sometimes in 80s from 24.5 percent immediately after the peak uh, impact of green revolution to 21.8 percent and uh, subsequently it has been in the declining trend and now it has uh, stood at 15 percent roughly and uh, uh, very interestingly very paradoxically we expect that the declining trend registered in contribution of uh, agriculture to total gdp should reflect on the changes in the uh, population stock as such because uh, otherwise the less number of people will be gaining more uh, resources from the manufacturing as well as service sector and on the other, and on the other hand the large percentage of people who depend on agriculture depends less on the resources from uh, agriculture sector as well now it is contributing around 10 percent to uh, 40 45 45 percent of the uh, agriculture population and not only in tamil nadu but also in the country as such so against this backdrop, I think the issue of focusing on agriculture assumes relevant. And uh, uh, though in the recent past, there has been downtrend uh, due to various reasons like consistent drought, excessive flood. And uh, uh, we would achieve the food security a lot, uh, food security to a larger extent, though we have to do more for the ensuring the uh, nutritional security. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, the same uh, trend has been witnessed both for India as well as in Tamil Nadu of our many agricultural uh, crops like paddy, cotton, horticultural crops, spices, and condiments. Uh, what we have to do is, at this moment, uh, though these, the, these crops are competitive for can as well as improve the packaging and high value crops so that we can export more and uh, reap the benefit in the farmer for it. Now, at the same time, we have of declining productivity in major crops after the 1990s. Perhaps this has been attributed with the uh, fact that it has been consistently ploughed for the nutrition of land. And then this, both production as well as productivity started either declining or started. Uh, stagnating or marginally started for instance the area under paddy growth decreased from 4.8 to 4.9 percent is a very serious issue we should take it back out similarly the growth of nutritious crops like millets the, the deceleration took place uh, or to the extent of 1.57 and the 4.8 percent uh, where the slide is now Also doing the same thing. Uh, and the similar trend was witnessed in the case in uh, nitri rich bulb pulses and uh, the uh, edible oil sector as well. Next one. But at the same time, we feel that the 
production of many crops increased. And in terms of food grains, the food grains increased to metric tons uh, in the 80s to 7.7 .7 million metric tons during 2002. So the data is old and continues even today. And as uh, my previous speaker, Professor uh, Suresh Mahu, was pointing out, Tamil Nadu is leading a larger state in terms of becoming urbanized. And therefore, there is a suspicion and uh, the net zone area has been diverted for housing and other projects uh, for a longer period. And uh, consequently, there is a deceleration in the net zone area in the state of Tamil Nadu. And the same case with the grass crop area as well, from 60 lakh, 66 lakh hectares to 62 lakh hectares. And uh, And a very interesting point is that the productivity domain with regard to productivity domain, despite uh, droughts and uh, adversities in natural aspects, the productivity in major crops like uh, ground yes, sugarcane, uh, maize, and bajira uh, was uh, consistently recording more than what the country's average. I know the data a little bit and the little bit later in a couple of slides. After this, I will show them. And uh, at this point, I would like to make a mention. We are glamour with the productivity in Punjab and the Tamil Nadu is the second in terms of registering productivity of paddy with uh, 3,415 kgs next only to Punjab. And the same case with the horticultural uh, crops like fruits, and all horticultural crops put together, and they registered 5.26%, 9.74%, and 9.08% respectively. This is a very welcoming trend because we record them as high value crops, which are not only essential for domestic consumption, but also for exporting to overseas. Therefore, uh, we could earn foreign exchange. Now, uh, from the state government, from the EMEA government, way back in 2015 and 16, the progressive state of Tamil Nadu was bestowed with the Kishi Karman Award for having recorded production of food grains in the country. Next. And as a component of uh, agricultural economy, let me also highlight the contributions made by allied sectors. For instance, the uh, uh, Tamil Nadu has, Tamil Nadu state has a uh, little more than 1000 kilometers coastline. And, uh, it has 1.9 lakh square kilometers of exclusive economic zone of fisheries, contributing to 5.95 lakh tons of marine fish production. And uh, from these two, we export and uh, we earn also foreign exchange. And uh, the marine sector supports more than uh, uh, 10.48 lakh marine fisher, uh, fisher women and men through 5,830 mechanized and 45,685 traditional fishing crabs in the marine sector. Uh, also, the state possesses 3.83 lakh hectares of inland water resources like surface water bodies, where it supports every good of 2.35 lakh population. And uh, another component is the brackish water area of 56,000 hectares is under captive fisheries with an area of 6,115 hectares in the coastal aquaculture production, mainly shrimp aquaculture. And of course, we do have the adverse uh, impact of ecological uh, aspects, particularly on the East Coast, and uh, despite the purpose of the fish, uh, fishery economy. And there are uh, uh, very uh, illustrative welfare schemes which are supporting the fisher, fishermen households, like uh, relief assistance of fishermen families during fishing ban and also lean periods. And uh, state savings come relief scheme for fisher women and the fishermen uh -huh. accidental insurance scheme. And the motorization of traditional crops and the setting up of air, air artificial reef. And all these help the fishery sector to uh -huh. have a holistic robust development yeah, as one of the allied sectors in agriculture. <laughs>
and the yet another major component or allied sector within the agriculture is animal husbandry the state reinforces breeding activities of cattle and buffalo actually there is a central scheme which is sponsored by the union government and the special to address this breeding of cattle and buffalo with a special focus on many components i don't want to get into all those details and a very innovative scheme i think the country first uh, tamil nadu introduced mobile veterinary units for each state each district now they are going to extend to each talukas and also a periodic health checkups of bovine uh, species uh, for controlling and uh, taking remedial measures for foot and mouth diseases these two are very serious issue across the country and tamil nadu is not an exception to this <coughs> and also the state government uh, provided free milk animals and goats to poor women households and this has ensured the economic security to poor households to a large extent that is what the empirical studies show and uh, very recently we have started three uh, veterinary colleges uh, constituted institutes of veterinary university located in uh, chennai and uh, all these cater uh, in the domain of research and development science and technology so that the high value breeds can be developed in the captive system uh, in addition to this we also uh, focus on the development of native breeds of bovine animals like kangay breed burhur milch animals umbala cherry trot animals and also may cherry goat in salem district now uh, with all these the uh, milk production has considerably increased and now the uh, milk producers cooperative societies across the state uh, produce around 6 lakh liters uh, a day so that uh, this is sold through the avin <coughs> brand and of course we do have private players in the milk procurement and the processing and uh, all that is uh, all that was possible due to the development of supportive systems like setting up of uh, livestock fodder bags and uh, <coughs> supply of green shoots for the farmers to start uh, developing the uh, green fodders and uh, uh, of course one of the important issues that need uh, attention is the development of scientific abattoirs so that the uh, processing of animals for export in the form of meat as well as, well as other milk products is the need of the hour this has been long due uh, in the state of tamil nadu and the third component within the agriculture is the forestry <coughs> and we have ambitious plans to develop economically rich trees like tea red sanders not only in the uh, state owned uh, estates but also from the private sector but there is a problem that is what we have been receiving <coughs> the sanction orders for harvesting high end uh, timbers like tea and red sanders is a serious issue especially for the small scale farmers at the grassroots level and therefore this needs attention from the policy intervention and the alpha forest is doing well so that the food and fruit yield and the fiber earning trees can be supplies can be grown the social forest was introduced with the support of cdc international development agency sila so that the five uh, fuel would supply as well as the water supplies ensured at the village level and then in the industrial forestry we do have plantations of cashewina and eucalyptus which is largely used in the paper and pulp industry and then minor forest produce including medicinal plants are promoted uh, through public private partnership both in the form of contract farming as well as individual plantations and eco eco tourism is one of the important areas where we attract the tourist <coughs> and uh, here we do have issues like on the one hand we need a development but at the same time we need to have a clear and a better environment Uh, there the uh, promotion of eco tourism particularly in the protected areas needs special provisions and as well as the frequent frequent uh, intervention by the east and the other issue is uh, i think uh, as the uh, as a serious issue in india uh, though they are reported largely in north india in among the south indian states tamil nadu is prone to uh, frequent forest fires and in this context the the manpower as well as materials uh, supply of materials as well as manpower should be uh, 
improved so that the forest fire can be uh, prevented at a faster scale so that the precious resources can be uh, uh, saved. And the forest okay. protection is yet another issue uh, yeah, from okay. the legal smuggling of forest products into the wildlife products okay. as well as for encroachment and things like uh, so that this issue needs to be taken care of. And in the area of wildlife resources, there are frequent man, animal, and treaty has been reported, particularly from the Western uh, God sessions. And the mangroves are under threat, particularly due to frequent yes. cyclones yes. in the east coast areas of Tamil Nadu coastline. Oh, and nice. uh, with regard to biodiversity, Tamil Nadu started uh, announcing the uh, Slender Laris Wildlife Sanctuary in Kadavur Forest Range of Dindical and the Karu disease over last year. This is one of the notable features in the whole world where the slender lorries are going to be protected. And uh, very interestingly, the state has got 18 Ramsar wetland sites, uh, the largest number in India next only to Madhya Pradesh. Uh, however, there are very serious issues due to the invasion of alien species, not only in the plain lands, but also in the forest ecosystems like Ipomia carnia, water essence, Prosophis juliflora, and the Lantana camera. And however, the state government is making attempt to eradicate and remove these species from the dense forest. But these uh, plants continue to grow and they're making a threat not only to flora, but also fauna, like larger animals like uh, elephants and so on. <laughs> And recently, the uh, Tamil Nadu state uh, uh, started supporting the development of Palmyra trees because Palmyra is the national tree, the state tree in Tamil Nadu. And recently, an ambitious plan with the support of development organization, uh, the entire stretch of 44 kilometers of Calvary Bank around. And this is plan for conserving and preserving the Wamaira in Tamil Nadu. And also subsidy to rice, the coconut saplings, and also compensation was extended due to the loss uh, caused the uh, uh, Kaja cyclone, Nivar, and also Oki in the recent past in Tamil Nadu. The next one. The another uh, area which gives a good fillip to the development of agriculture is cooperatives. As we all know, Tamil Nadu is one of the known states for the development of cooperatives stretching many sectors, more than 225 uh, items are covered under cooperatives. Societies are dominant in this system. And uh, the of charity groups, in line with the uh, Bangladesh <coughs> Grameen Bank model, Tamil Nadu has been encouraging the formation of joint liability groups so that the credit dis dispersal as well as the recovery would be very convenient and easy for tiny farmers <laughs> having five acres and also purchasing of milk animals and for starting petty business activities uh, focusing on more on women. And in, in addition to this, the uh, loan facilities for crop cultivation as well as produce uh, uh, pledge loan. Uh, the loan can be obtained on the agricultural products like RDN, and things like you know the uh, uh, little less perishable commodities, and also loans to giant liability groups and self help groups, uh, investment credit for agricultural and allied activities. This is uh, extended in terms of in the form of long term loans, and the micro credit to petty traders, and uh, consequently the women entrepreneurs are emerging as uh, independent uh, livelihood saver in countryside of the state. Other, si other services uh, extended by the cooperatives include crop insurance and common service centers, etc. <clears throat> now, let me give some statistical information where the state of Tamil Nadu stands. Uh, we have listed here agriculture and uh, allied sectors. In terms of production, uh, Tamil Nadu's share uh, uh, ranges from 8-7% to 20% on certain aspects. For instance, <coughs> the fishery production accounts for 10 to 12 percent, but it exports 
15 to 20 percent share of the country seafood. Similarly, in terms of dairy products, the state contributes in the production of uh, ranging 7 to 10 percent of the country, and uh, it uh, encourages exports as well. Though it also focuses more on the consumption of milk at local level, domestic level. Uh, uh, Professor Rajendra, and, sorry to interrupt. Can we yeah. uh, wind up in five to seven minutes? I will do that. I will do that. Oh. And yet another important aspect is I spoke about the productivity of major crops in the beginning. And you can see on the extreme right. The pulses, maize, yes. cotton, all other crops in Tamil Nadu shows better performance. Uh, and also uh, irrigation, yet another important facility. Uh, I, we have parity data for India as well as Tamil Nadu. Uh, here, Though the assured irrigated area stands for the country as 50 percent, it is surprising that it is only uh, uh, around 32 percent for Tamil Nadu, despite the fact that it recorded uh, considerably and significantly better performance in terms of productivity. This is a point we would like to uh, highlight here. It means the water efficiency is more in the state, and uh, there are initiatives to develop the water bodies through. Uh, the help of farmers as well as the local communities like Udimaramat and things like, and we can uh, see the results in the future. Now, the recent policies, Tamil Nadu Agro Industrial Corridor and the Tamil Nadu Protected Special Agricultural Zone Act 2020 enables to protect the Kaveri built on the largest scale, but uh, however, we need, uh, we need to wait and see how the state government is taking, to, uh, taking uh, forward these two interventions. And these are the uh, Tamil Nadu's recent initiatives for uh, the promotion of agriculture development, like introduction of sustainable agriculture practices, crop loan waiver scheme, integrated farming system, Kisan credit system, the Kisan credit scheme, farmer producer organizations. And in spite of all these uh, interventions, we do come across certain critical issues, critical areas where we need uh, the intervention uh, on the domain of post harvest losses, supply of spurious inputs, low coverage of crop insurance despite your glamorous with the uh, uh, spreading of crop insurance aspect across the country, poor storage facility, vulnerable farmers, and uh, less value addition to uh, economically uh, important crops, compartmentalized procurement system, indifferent attitude of the farmers in reclaiming water bodies, Long pending elections to water resource associations, corruption in the administrative system, less attention to size, sunrise, economically viable agro industries, and the climate. Uh, suggestions where we can intervene and uh, look forward to have such and efficient farming system in the days to come. Now, let me move on to the second uh, section on social development this would be peaceful <clears throat> next yeah uh, friends i think uh, professor banamurthy mentioned in the beginning tamil Nadu's welfare state and uh, we have uh, classical programs uh, i would like to uh, make a mention here we have 15 schemes including the noon meal and the breakfast scheme for school children and uh, there are many empirical studies not only by indian authors but also uh, the world bank and uh, other international agencies reported that all these contributed for improving the uh, enrollment, retention rate, and also the uh, uh, general performance of the school education as such. And with regard to higher education, the gross enrollment ratio, particularly female enrollment ratio, is extremely high. I think it's actually 51% in Tamil Nadu, where India stands around sorry, 26%. Similar case with the technical and the professional education as well. And with regard to health infrastructure, we have robust facilities, including uh, primary health centers. And the density of health personnel is uh, comparatively high in Tamil Nadu. We have mobile health units and health insurance coverage. And in addition to these uh, health direct interventions, we do have additional uh, security programs like uh, introduction of AMA CAT in urban areas, major urban areas which takes care of the nutritional security to a considerable extent. And the housing infrastructure, 
in the form of caseless colonies. We have uh, around 116, 160 caseless colonies in the state, which promotes the social harmony besides in ensuring the housing facility. Transportation, transportation facilities are robust and where we have highly subsidized uh, transportation facilities for women and folk. Here I have some indicators, social indicators, where we have better performance as compared to the country as such. Tamil Nadu stands in terms of IMR with 35.2 and whereas <coughs> uh, uh, the uh, Indians, I think there is some problem here, actually it should be reversed. Uh, next one. And in terms of neonatal mortality, country recorded 24.9% and state has only 15%. Similarly, we could see other aspects as well. Next one. In terms of literacy, Tamil Nadu is performing well. Uh, and uh, overall human development index for the last uh, 10 years, Tamil Nadu recorded fairly uh, uh, better uh, performance with 0.738 as compared to 0.63 with regard to India. And uh, I thank you all for your patience listening. And uh, with this, I end and thank all of you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Elaborate presentation on agriculture as well as uh, uh, social sector. As um, you know, Professor Suraj Babu said, you know, if you want to talk about Tamil Nadu, one session is not sufficient. So, you know, if you want to talk about Tamil Nadu agriculture, I don't think one session is sufficient. And I'm glad that you brought so many issues. And I thought, you know, when, when you started, you're going to paint a very pessimistic picture. But at the end, I thought, I mean, you presented a not so pessimistic picture. And that's very important uh, for all of us. Uh, I know Professor uh, Dr. Ashok Kisandas, uh, he was part of CSCP. Maybe he'll have many more things to talk about agriculture sector. But I'm only one issue I was looking at, you know, what is happening to the overall terms of trade in in agriculture, I think that's something that we may want to look at a little more detail, particularly when we compare between the states. Um, is that a major determinant of how the agriculture sector performs uh, compared to other sectors and other states? So maybe that we can come back to that a little later. So let me come to the third speaker now, uh, Professor uh, uh, Prashant Kumar Panda. Uh, uh, he's going to speak something related to Tamil Nadu fiscal situation. Thank you. Uh, respected uh, Professor Bhanumurthy and uh, Chairperson for this session and distinguished panels. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Professor Bhanumurthy and uh, the EGRO organizations for the opportunity. And uh, it is a great opportunity to listen to uh, our mentors, Professor Bhanumurthy, Professor Suresh Babu, and Professor Rajendran Sen. And uh, in fact, uh, all the presentations are complementing to each other. It is from industry, agriculture, fiscal policy development, social welfare schemes. And so all the uh, uh, very well uh, coordinated and well arranged and uh, it's uh, complementing to each other. Let me go to my presentations. Whether the presentation is visible, sir? Yes, yes, Dr. Panda, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, when we, we are talking about the development experiences and development paradigm, I think when we talk about uh, in Indian context, state development and state development paradigm, I think Tamil Nadu will survey perfectly lab. We can say whether it is social sector development, economic development, or it is be it industrial development, infrastructure development, or fiscal development. And Tamil Nadu has emerged as a very much progressive state and it has uh, emphasized on inclusive development so perfectly. And uh, this is this is a perfectly to analyze the developments of Tamil Nadu and understanding its in critical indicators and drivers. And Professor Suresh Babu in his presentations uh, has pointed out the important drivers. And one of the important driver is the role of states in the context of welfare state. And uh, we have to understand the dynamics uh, of the role of state, changing dynamics and changing perspective of state finances. 
and fiscal prudency plays a very important role. Fiscal policy plays a very important role. Overall development of states, be it agriculture, be it industry, be it social sector developments. So in this context, uh, I am going to talk about uh, the fiscal policy developments and the way forward. And uh, this 10, 10 minutes, we may be discussing about uh, the fiscal policy challenges and fiscal policy developments, what drive in Tamil Nadu to this uh, stage. And today we are talking about Tamil Nadu is one of the important state and best performing states and how these fiscal policy parameters play an important role we are going to discuss in this 10-15 minutes. So I have arranged my presentation is this. What are the benchmark? What are the hallmark of fiscal developments that has taken place in Tamil Nadu? First, we will elucidate on this. Then we will see the current state of fiscal developments and the state finance uh, issues in Tamil Nadu. And to what extent the quality of deficits, deficit management reforms, and whether the Tamil Nadu all in all these aspects, whether it has made the FRBM targets. Then we'll see what are the main issues in fiscal policy management and the way forward. And if you look at what are the main drivers, what are the main fiscal benchmarks in Tamil Nadu? I have classified into few points. All those things I have classified into few points. And the first and foremost, what is more important for Tamil Nadu state finances is that one of the important aspect of Tamil Nadu state finances is the state has significant mobilization of one tax, one tax revenues, particularly uh, from the own sources, own tax revenues throughout the decade bearing. Uh, and if you look at uh, around 2000 onwards, and uh, the state uh, own tax revenue mobilizations was around 8.3 point 8.3% uh, of GSDP and uh, within a decade it has moved to 9.5% around 10% of GSDP and only this last 4 5 years it is alarming it has come down to 5 point around 6 percentage so a point of time it was 8 percent again it moved to 10 percentage now it has come down to 5.9 percentage of GSDP and uh, uh, besides that, if you look at uh, the overall, Tamil Nadu was never a transport dependent economy. What is the meaning of that? So actually what I want to say by this is that if you look at the total size of the revenue receipts of the Tamil Nadu, and Tamil Nadu more or less depend more on its own revenue mobilizations, whether it is a tax revenue mobilization, whether it is non-tax revenue mobilizations, around 78 to 80 percent of the total receipts are made by the own revenue mobilizations. Only 20 to 20 percent or 20 to 20 percent of receipts Tamil Nadu depends upon central transports. Moreover, being a high per capita income and moreover uh, being a progressive state, Tamil Nadu doesn't have that luxury to have more uh, widespread availability of central transports. So here, what is important factor is that uh, this has been evolving over the period of time. And if you look at 2002, 77.8% of revenues were from the uh, own revenue accounts or own tax and non-tax revenues. And central transports, um, more or less 20 to 20% states depend upon. Another important aspect uh, of this development, economic development in Tamil Nadu is the persistent and continuity in capital spending and infrastructure developments. If you look at uh, starting from the 80s and 90s, and even if we can find uh, even the recent decades also, and the capital spending was around 2 to 2 to 2.5% of GSDP, and that has continued for a long time. And uh, with certain barriers in the few years we can find. So this is one of the important, and we'll, when we'll move to uh, the data, we can clearly see and how the state has emphasized pertaining to capital spending, and that is one of the key uh, factor for developing of the economy. And similarly, when uh, we can see the more amount of uh, the borrowings are spent for capital spending and uh, various infrastructure spendings, and that obviously attract uh, the private sector investments. So this is another significant factor in public finance developments in Tamil Nadu that uh, state policy supports crowding in of private sector investments and industry promotions and uh, one of the pioneer Tamil Nadu is one of the pioneer state and which has promoted uh, industries, uh, private sectors and industries for long. 
And similarly, uh, there is also emphasis pertaining to sustainable development goals, human resource developments, consistent, that is a consistent allocation to education sectors, particularly engineering and technical educations. However, when we look at the health sectors, and uh, it is the allocation is not encouraging, and where the state has to do a, a do a do a play its role and uh, significantly it has to increase its allocations, and uh, are around the allocation is less than a percentage, uh, one percent of GSDP. If you look at the particularly health sector allocations, however, in the Tamil Nadu we can find. The role of private sector in a health sector also play a big role, and as a result, health sector indicators are uh, quite uh, good. And uh, as we have seen, the all the panels, uh, all the panel members have highlighted that uh, Tamil Nadu's uh, significant role in implementing social welfare schemes and emphasis on inclusive development. In fact, we can say Tamil Nadu is the mother of uh, all states uh, in India in implementing all innovative schemes. Whether it is a mid name skill or you can say breakfast scheme or it is Yama canteen or even if a livelihood promotion schemes, child, women, girl child protection schemes, or you can say distribution of freebies, even distribution of freebies also, political uh, schemes also started from Tamil Nadu and that has spread across and one by one other states have followed. So there are a number of good schemes implemented, particularly to uh, public distribution PDAs. And uh, then we can find a uh, lot of schemes about pertaining to food securities and all started from the Tamil Nadu. Uh, so that these are all significant aspect, particularly in implementation of social welfare schemes. And if you look at up to 2015-16, this fiscal deficits, public debt performed well in post-FRBM era and the impact of uh, this FRBM continued for long, particularly for Tamil Nadu. While it is for other states lasted for two to three years after implementation of uh, five to seven, we can say 2005, 2007 or 2008 it continued. After that, again, all the indicators uh, suit up the um, targets. But in case of Tamil Nadu, it continued for long and only recent years after COVID we can find and there is the revenue deficit, the fiscal deficit targets overshooting. And but still it is under control. I think within two to three years, uh, again, those can streamline and those can sustain within the limits. And if you look at these, uh, these data and uh, we can find the own tax revenue. We can find the one tax revenue already have mentioned in 2004-05, it was 8.84% of GSDP. Then it has uh, increasing to 8.39 in 2008-9 and subsequently it has come down now to around 6%. But what is more alarming is the deceleration decline of continuous decline of one non-tax revenue in the states. And obviously understand uh, almost this is true for almost all states. There is a limited scope for re mobilizing um, revenues from non-tax sources, particularly these are the uh, profits from public sector undertakings, user fees, then uh, fees and fines. And uh, so fiscal various services we use to get uh, certain fees and fines. But in case of Tamil Nadu, there is a scope. There is a scope for, for mobilizing non-tax revenues because it has a vast uh, coastline and uh, mainly tourism services and a uh, lot of uh, uh, additional services, they can mobilize resources from user charges, they can mobilize resources from strengthening public sector undertakings. There are a number of public sector undertakings, PSUs under the Tamil Nadu, which can be uh, utilized and their performance can be reviewed so that uh, at least the revenue mobilization can be better. And if you look at uh, states' own revenue, including both tax and non tax, it is around 10 percentage, and it has been constant quite for some time. And it recently it has come down to 7.76 percentage. And uh, similarly, uh, we, we can understand, look at the composition of expenditures, and we can find the capital expenditures almost remain 2.58 uh, percent of GDP, and it is, has come down to around 2 percentage, more or less remains stable, and uh, with the slightly decelerations, but almost remains stable. And uh, so, and similarly, if you look at the deficit targets, and uh, we can say for some years uh, we have, and uh, only revenue deficit slightly has gone up. One percent is uh, we have overshoot the FRBM targets. Fiscal deficit is within the limits, and outstanding liabilities uh, 22 percent is, which is also as per the recommendation of 14th Finance Commissions. 
And uh, the recent years, it has gone up to outstanding liability has gone up to 26 percentage, but still within the limits. And if you look at uh, the other key indicators for the recent years, already we have uh, pointed out one tax revenue uh, has moved from 7.92 percent in 2011 12 to 5.7%, which is a little bit has come down, and state has to put more efforts and for mobilizing because this is one of the important because uh, as we can see, the, there is a continuous decline in uh, central transport to the states because of the uh, changing of the criteria from the finance commission to finance commissions, giving more weightage, giving more weightage to the uh, income distance criteria. And uh, once we move away from the uh, particularly the, the criteria for fiscal performance, other things, and obviously Tamil Nadu is getting uh, the, the share of the Tamil Nadu has been drastically declining. If you look at from the third finance commission to 14th finance commission, its share has come down from 8 percentage to 4 percentage. So obviously, only option for the Tamil Nadu is to strengthen its own revenue mobilizations, both tax revenues and non-tax revenues, and strengthen uh, the different uh, taxes wherever the balance is possible. And though we can find out, uh, if you look at the own tax as percent of GSTP, this is for the comparison between different states, including Tamil Nadu, and uh, there are some states uh, ahead of Tamil Nadu, but Tamil Nadu has been also consistently doing good and 6.4% uh, four, 6 and for the last, we can say 2023. And besides, if you look at the important uh, compositions of the taxes, uh, in the, one of the important taxes is the sales tax that gives uh, more revenues, which has been replaced with the uh, GST. That itself contributes around uh, 60, uh, 77 percentage of the total uh, re own revenue mobilizations, own tax mobilizations of the states. And the other importance, uh, once sales tax have been merged with the GST, then the other taxes which are very limited uh, scope for the states to mobilize resources. And uh, at present, state excise is with the state, and then besides that, motor vehicle tax, another uh, better revenue giving taxes for the states. And uh, similarly, stamps and registration duties and states should try how better effectively can utilize these other sources, other important taxes and to check leakages and uh, so that uh, those uh, and adopt uh, technologies for this mobilization so that better revenue mobilization can take place and the state can strengthen its own revenue mobilizations. And similarly, if you look at the expenditure part uh, that uh, the major expenditures, uh, uh, you can say the social services, 5% of uh, GSTP, economic services, 3 point, and altogether development expenditures is 8.4 by 45 percentage of uh, the, this is one of the strength for the state that uh, in spite of uh, the debt is around 20 to 20% 20 of the state GSTP, but majority of the resources are being used for developmental expenditures as a result. This will generate uh, more productions and employment for the states and uh, will help to sustain the public debt as well as the economy. But what is important here is the interest payment. Interest payment is one of the alarming and it is around 2% of uh, GSTP, which is very high and uh, which needs to be rationalized and which needs to be states should find some mechanism to check particularly interest payment. And you know to make debt sustainability, this is also one important aspect which we have to look that we have to check on interest payments. And these are various categories of services as uh, percent to total revenue expenses and how the total revenue expenditure is spent. And here, in case of Tamil Nadu, the share of development expenditure is higher than the non development which is a good sign. Non development expenditures and uh, more or less uh, the significant portion goes for social services and uh, economic services so which are good uh, uh, so it's good signs for development indicators and if you look at the similarly the capital expenditures capital expenditure has been uh, almost same there are no much changes 17% uh, of the total expenditures and this has slightly reduced to 14% and now also almost 14 to 17% 
So this has to be further rationalized and it's required because revenue expenditures and when we borrow money more and uh, spend on revenue aspects or current expenses, then quality of deficit is questionable. So obviously, and uh, the state should uh, find some ways and means to rationalize the expenditures and uh, spend more on capital expenditures. There is scope for improvement for capital expenditures. And as a result, what will happen? That will really help for uh, mobilizing uh, more infrastructure spendings, more uh, public sector infrastructures, and production and employment in the state. And this is the share of own tax revenue and central transfers, as I had mentioned earlier, that uh, states heavily depend upon own resources than uh, central transports. And you can see the upper line is the share of own revenues, and which has been moving almost, and only last few years slightly has been declined. And whereas in the last few years, the share of transports also slightly increased. And if you already have uh, mentioned this, that uh, if, if you look at the, uh, the share of uh, central transports uh, for Tamil Nadu, it has been continuously declining. And because of the changing of the criteria, and as the uh, state is moving in terms of per capita income, and it is not getting additional uh, resources in terms of income criteria or income distance criteria. And uh, frequent change of criteria also some kind of uh, it, it affects the stability of central uh, flow funds to the state and it also affects its uh, economic growth and uh, development. And uh, so a state should uh, put its how more emphasis can be given to pertaining to fiscal performances, fiscal criteria, so the state can get also more revenue mobilizations that have to be uh, put before the commissions. Besides, states should also put more efforts in uh, mobilizing resources from its sources. This is the revenue and uh, fiscal balance, fiscal deficit. When we come to about quality of deficits, here we can see that uh, in the recent budget, the revenue deficit is 1.6% of GSTP, and uh, whereas and the fiscal deficit has gone above the three percentage targets and uh, however there is assessment and there is a projections that within two to three years they will stabilize and they will bring down the fiscal deficit to uh, less than three percentage and this is uh, the when we look at the quality of government spending we have to see actually uh, how the debt is utilized and uh, whether debt is utilized more for development spending, more for capital spending, or debt is utilized for the current, spend, current spending. If debt is utilized for the current spending, obviously the, the quality of deficit is questionable and debt sustainability also will be questionable. So here, what is important in case of Tamil Nadu that uh, we have observed in the uh, precedence past years, and the green line uh, shows particularly the capital expenditures and uh, with when the uh, fiscal deficit is moving up and along with the capital spending is also moving up. So there is just some synchronizations and uh, that's why this uh, sustainability is prudent, fiscal policy is prudent in Tamil Nadu and debt sustainability is not a problem. And this is the debt as a percentage of this is within limit, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, 22.29% uh, of GSTP recently it has gone up to 26 percent. But still, considering the situation of COVID and post COVID as we're dealing with, this is a level is uh, still under uh, under control and uh, definitely one state will mobilize the resources from the own sources. Definitely this also will change. And if you look at the how the state's uh, fiscal deficit behaves after the FRBM, and this number 12, number 12 uh, is pertaining to Tamil Nadu, you can say after 2004, 2003 state implemented FRBM, after 2004 onwards, uh, the fiscal deficit has, uh, has started decelerating, declining, and it lasted for long, around 2012-13, it lasted for long, and which doesn't have to happen in case of other states, that's one of the good uh, shows the good fiscal management of the state. And what we quickly observe from this uh, that the fiscal strength of state is own resource mobilizations. There is a declining own tax revenue recent years, which is a matter of concerns. So states should mobilize the buoyancy and rationalist with GST rates will help, but states should focus on improving the balance of states taxes under its own purview, such as motor vehicle tax, state excise. Rationalization of rates and checking leakages, increasing of tax GST ratios, very important for reducing deficit and financing, increasing revenue expenditure and capital expenditures. 
Mobilization of revenue from non-tax revenue is continuously declining. And Tamil Nadu has potential in reviewing this. Functioning of state PSUs needs a review. Review of fees and user charges also. There is a need to assess, particularly in the domain of tourism sectors, in the domain of uh, different sectors. And growing revenue expenditure is a matter of conscience, which needs uh, to be checked and rationalization is required uh, and prioritization is required. And more expenditure can be prioritized towards SDG and sustainable development, human development indicators. Particular subsidies on food, fertilizer, energy in growing in case of Tamil Nadu and deteriorating the quality of deficits. And uh, so government should think on how we can rationalize these subsidy expenses. More borrowed resources to finance current expenditure is a uh, current expenditure needs to be checked. Otherwise, it may worsen the quality of deficits. So continuity in refers agenda for any state, including Tamil Nadu, is always welcome. Fiscal consolidation needs to be reflected in budgets as well as we have to make a check on populist budget announcements and uh, outcome. And we should emphasize on outcome and utilization of the budgets. Maintaining fiscal and revenue deficit targets and debt fiscal sustainability in medium term and long term required. But in short term, they may suit the targets, but at least in medium term, we should target the state should target for medium term fiscal framework and how to manage these deficits. Government to ensure rules of economic games, proper legal framework and assignment of property rights and developing industry ecosystem, which is there, they should how that can be continued for promoting more private sector investments and the industries in the state. Economic growth along with the development of social sectors are important. Priority allocation for health sector, particularly and linking with the SDG indicators, are essential in the context of Tamil Nadu. Both fiscal management and economy of Tamil Nadu would continue to be sustainable, and we hope, and the state will be definitely role model for rest of states. So thank you so much, and for the opportunity, I hope I have covered some points for the yeah, state fiscal development. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Panda. I think you have brought in so many issues. Uh, I think uh, you also echo what uh, Professor Ray Babu raised in the beginning that uh, OTR and ONTR is a major concern. Uh, but I think it's not a major concern only in Tamil Nadu, but I think in many of the states. Uh, but I also was slightly, um, uh, what to say, um, I just wanted to understand one important aspect in one of your uh, table. Tamil Nadu was a revenue surplus state for a long time and I think it turned out to be a revenue deficit state in the recent period. I think that seems to be a very qualitatively very different economy compared to pre-COVID. Uh, that's something that I thought uh, we can uh, just discuss. And the yeah. other thing is uh, 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 what is the state doing when it comes to uh, asset monetization? In fact, uh, this has been a issue for uh, many uh, states. Um, there is a policy at the top level, but I think uh, where, when it comes to the states, uh, the whole issue of asset monetization has not really taken up in a big way. So maybe that is one area, uh, particularly when it comes to resource mobilization uh, internally, I think that's something that uh, we can uh, discuss. The third is, um, between the revenues and expenditures, I think there are, most of the time we keep speaking much about uh, uh, revenue mobilization, but I think uh, when it comes to expenditures also, there could, there should be some discussion on, uh, you know, uh, rationalization, right? I think, uh, I know there are some states, they don't even know how many number of schemes that state has, not just uh, common people, but even the finance department may not know how many number of schemes that state is implementing. In fact, well, some states say it's 1800 schemes. So I don't know whether it's the same thing when it comes to the state of Tamil Nadu. So overall, uh, you, I think you have given a very good picture about uh, fiscal situation as well as the um, concerns for the Tamil Nadu state. So before I open to the uh, audience, uh, in fact, uh, they can also write in the chat box if they want to write. Uh, anybody wants to raise any question to any of the panelists? Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. Uh, see, uh, let me at the outset say that uh, these all the speakers spoke exceedingly well and they they hit the nail on the head and 
on the Tamil Nadu, many things which our esteemed panelists said, I, I honestly did not know, but we have the larger picture for all India. There's two, three things. Uh, one, one to uh, Professor ba Babu about, uh, uh, I mean, he didn't say the word discrimination, but implicitly he was saying that when there is a um, uh, natural disaster in Tamil Nadu, uh, the assistant from the center is much lower compared to what they demand. So uh, one is comparing Tamil Nadu itself. Is it is it true for all the state across the board or are only for Tamil Nadu? That is a question one. Second, which is a, uh, I would like to request all the three panelists or all the four, including the chair, to throw some light on agriculture because agriculture it's at the national level, uh, farmer situation is very, very difficult compared to the non-farmer. And those uh, domestic resource cost is very heavy because that is not visible to the farmer. It does not affect. But at the same time, the water stress and the judicious utilization of the land, for example, Tamil Nadu is a uh, relatively water is not a comfortable with water but yet the uh, production of sugar cane which is a uh, water guzzling crop a uh, uh, lot of uh, things are done and how to handle this situation on one hand we are water stable on the other end we are exporting sugar and uh, rice so uh, and and on subsidy where where is the end end for subsidy because there are large number of studies which shows uh, it is always better to, to move towards the investment rather than the subsidy because the return on them is much better. The growth will be much better. So these are the issue. And our, our friend, uh, um, Professor Rajendran, he, he was uh, talking more on the, uh, the, the quantity terms of the production, if I correctly understood. But many studies show when you increase the production, especially of the agriculture, farmers' income go down. So, so in value term, because at the end of the round, uh, how much farmers earn the income or make the return, that is important, not how much they produce in physical quantity. So these are the certain issues which, which really pass through my mind. I would uh, request all the panelists to, to throw some light on that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? They can also write in the chat box if there's any question that they have so that uh, panelists can uh, respond. So can I request uh, uh, Professor Suresh Babu to respond to the questions? Yeah, uh, so the, the point about funding, especially with the disaster funding is is something that we need to really look into now. And that is one of the submissions to the 16th Finance Commission now. Because, you know, you have, um, you have the uh, drastic changes as far as the uh, formula for funding that has taken place in terms of the uh, disaster management that has come. Now, uh, the, the problem here is that uh, there is in the last finance commission, there is a comprehensive kind of an approach that was given in terms of disaster funding. But your uh, discretionary power of the state to allocate from one head to another head is very limited. And finance commissions then need to give some kind of a flexibility for this kind of, you know, uh, inter head allocation in terms of disaster funding. Second, uh, when we look at Tamil Nadu, the, the problem is that it is cyclone prone, definitely, but uh, it is also drought prone. Yeah? Unlike a, a lot of other states which are either cyclone prone or drought prone, this is hit from both sides. So. These kind of states then need to be given some additional kind of assistance when it comes to disaster. One of the problems that we come across when we talk about this kind of disaster funding is that uh, quite often the economic loss due to disasters are cal not calculated in a very scientific manner. 
Yeah. See, we have typically three heads in terms of, you know, uh, relief, yeah, repair and restoration that, that happens in a post-disaster scenario. Relief is something that is given immediately. But repair and restoration at times requires capital expenditure. And a state which is having difficulty in terms of raising resources is finding it very difficult to have this capital expenditure. Now, please remember, this capital expenditure is replacing an existing capital. Exp a capital. It is not new in terms of your capital stock. It is not an addition. For example, there was a bridge earlier or whatever, an infrastructure facility that was earlier, which is now washed away by a cyclone. And the next year, if the state is investing to build that bridge, it is actually replacing. It is not a net addition to the capital stock. So, in the second and third component, that is in terms of uh, uh, restoring as well as in terms of uh, uh, reconstruction post in the post-disaster period, capital expenditure involvement is required. And that is where perhaps Finance Commission now needs to have a, a different take. And that would be my response to uh, the question. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Professor Ajayendran, very briefly, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are two points uh, uh, highlighted. The point one, water stress, and the second one is, uh, despite we have been increasing aggregate production as well as productivity, uh, still farmers are under distress. And uh, if you take the first aspect, the water is uh, water is uh, distress. It is true. Uh, the point I would like to mention here is in India we have more than percent but on the other hand in Tamil Nadu we have 38 percent of the red zone area is irrigated but despite the productivity is high it shows that the farmers are efficiently utilizing the crucial resource of water point number one point number two yes of course irrigation is an important resource natural resource which need to be judiciously and scientifically utilized for which there are different techniques as well as the policy interventions the techniques include application of small water structures like drip irrigation sprinklers etc and at policy level we hope to see that how best we can regenerate and deepen the water body surface water bodies because in places like tamil nadu the surface water bodies play a major role in irrigating the uh, uh, agricultural land. Therefore, it is true that the water is uh, stressed uh, everywhere, not only with the Tamil Nadu, but how judiciously and uh, optimally we are utilizing is an important thing. The second point, when we talk about the remuneration of agriculture sector, there is a saying in the popular write-ups, Indian farmers born in debt, live in debt and die in debt. And the important reason for this kind of situation is there is a general concept immediately after the Green Revolution that the terms of trade is highly unfavorable to agriculture sector. It means the price is modestly controlled by the state, both the union government as well as the state governments. Though we claim that we are supporting them with the minimum support price MSP and then additional incentives, etc. However, if you see the market price, it is always or normally more than what is the price given by the state or the union government in the form of minimum support price. Therefore, always the price of agriculture commodities is suppressed and hence the farmers are bound to either make it or sometimes dump on the roadside even uh, as the farmers are not getting even the laborers cost. So this is a ground reality for which I think we need to have location specific, issue specific, commodity specific interventions all over the country. Uh, this cannot be, as uh, Professor Banamuthi was telling, this cannot be decided, this cannot be discussed at uh, one's own goal. So this is the response uh, to the uh, second point. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... I think I see a question in the chat box that um, by Mr. Shankar Rao. Many states are resorting to our budget borrowings to evade the FRBM limits. Can you please explain the situation of our budget borrowings in Tamil Nadu? Professor Panda, you want to take 
on this hardware process unit of one of you. Uh, sir, actually, these uh, off budget uh, borrowings uh, are uh, being practiced in almost all states, including Tamil Nadu. And uh, most of the time, you can see uh, these uh, off budget borrowings, particularly by the public sector units, PS units for special purposes, special uh, needs. And sometimes they bypass through budget, and uh, the same is not reflected in budget, and even doesn't come with the legislative scrutiny or even FRBM limits. And they used to borrow for specific needs for a short term basis or uh, for special uh, needs. That is being practiced and which is a challenge uh, both for uh, now fiscal deficit as well as uh, and meeting this uh, fiscal uh, prudency. And that is in Tamil Nadu also this is there because uh, Tamil Nadu we can find more number of uh, state uh, public sector undertakings and these kind of borrowings. But we have to make a study on this and uh, but it is there. Yeah, uh, Suraj Babu, you want to comment on this? On a lighter way, I want to tell you that there is a, so much of computation. Uh, how to be so innovative in borrowing our budget from among the states? So I know, I think that's a major challenge, not only for state government, but also for the central finance department, how to capture this our budget. Even, even the you know, statutory auditors are finding it very difficult to see how to estimate the budget so, yeah, so I think that is one of the problems as you correctly summarized. There is quite a bit of innovation that is happening in terms of, you know, cleverly borrowing from the market. And we know that our neighboring state Kerala did a very clever innovation in having a separate entity called KIFB trying to borrow through that, but it was, you know, caught or whatever it is in terms of this thing. <laughs> but when we talk about the off budget borrowings of Tamil Nadu, as I completely agree with uh, Prashant's point that most of it is in terms of the uh, public sector utilities that, that that is happening. And that is where perhaps the return on investment is also very low. So that's something which we will have to focus quite sharply now in the years to come, because you are actually borrowing on one hand and your return on investment is also low, which means that you will have to really, you know, look at this more closely. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions uh, from the audience? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, please. Yes. Korean from Kerala. Yes, please. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead, sir. Hello, go ahead, sir. Hello. Uh, there's one question in the chat box in the meantime. Has Tamil Nadu issued gender budget statement? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are Hello. audible. Yeah, perhaps you can actually switch off the video and ask the question in audio. Professor Korean, yeah. uh, you, you are not uh, clearly audible, so please write your question in the chat box. So and Answer. So, in the meantime, can somebody answer this uh, as Tamil Nadu issued gender budget statement? Pass. I, I have to verify it, but I think almost all states are uh, issuing gender budget along with the budget. And uh, they may not, some states may not be exclusively bringing it in a statement format, but there is their priority of allocations for women specific schemes and women specific uh, allocations they used to highlight. And Tamil Nadu used to do that, I think. No, my question is, okay, you have a gender budget statement, then what? Yeah. So I think as an economist, I think we need to focus a little more on what next, yeah. not, not just on the statement. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, if you look at this uh, gender budget statement is mainly for meeting 
that uh, how we can specifically help uh, women folk uh, in various schemes and other things and uh, particularly the allocations which in the budget is taking place how much allocation is being given for the women specific schemes and various schemes they used to highlight and main purpose is to reduce the gender bias and uh, uh, particularly meeting this women specific needs in the welfare schemes particularly my, my question is is it doing that job yeah <laughs> that we okay. have to assess yeah, I mean, actually what extent yeah. we have uh, fulfilled the objectives and uh, what are the purpose actually whether really fulfilled or not we have to assess we have to see yeah uh, dr panda there is a question in the chat box i think it's related yeah. to fiscal only even dr babu can yeah. check it Maybe one of you can and answer. They, uh, the question is pertaining to why there is a fall in non-tax revenues, and uh, particularly you see uh, the one important component of non-tax revenue is the profits from public sector undertakings. And in particularly Tamil Nadu, we have more than sixty public sector undertakings are functioning, functional. But to what extent they are mobilizing profit and their performances, their fiscal uh, um, gain? Those are really questions, and because of that, this is one aspect where it has come. Second, uh, when you look at fees, fines, and user charges, sometimes these are also not politically attractive. And uh, states also sometimes may not fully focus on these aspects, particularly user charges, specific uh, fees or fines. So as a result, uh, from various components, we used to get uh, uh, the as a result, whatever the non-tax revenue mobilizations becomes less and less over the years. So there is a need to assess actually what are the sectors like uh, suppose uh, the state has a lot of coastlines, a lot of tourism activities takes places. So we can impose additional user charges and uh, additional fees for different facilities. So that way we can mobilize more revenues and we have to evaluate the performances of mainly public sector undertakings. And uh, suppose if these uh, undertakings uh, are not performing. And as I pointed out, we can go for monetization of assets and other things. And so those also will come under non tax revenues. Dr. Sri Babu, you want to quickly? No, basically, the whole space for states for increasing non tax revenues have reduced over a period of time. Because the constant item that we find is increasing the registration fees. Yeah, you buy an apartment, then you get into a lot of trouble in terms of the registration processes and fees now. But there is a limit for that because we also need to support the real estate industry, which is a very, very vibrant sector as far as Tamil Nadu is concerned. So what has happened is that over a period of time, the, the possibilities for states for non-tax revenue is actually shrinking. But that is where we should focus on efficiency. Yeah, for example, how how efficiently can we collect what is available in terms of these kind of things? And that is something which perhaps the state has to really focus. Now, uh, there is one related point, which is uh, not to that. Uh, perhaps one of the things that Tamil Nadu should now focus is more in terms of uh, devolution to the local bodies and things of that sort. Because that is an area perhaps, you know, uh, Tamil Nadu is not doing that well compared to a lot of other states. Yeah, in terms of the third tier of or the grassroots level, what we call as. Yeah, there is one question uh, by uh, Ms. Darshini. I think the Finance Commission needs to focus on non-tax revenue to increase states towards mobilizing more resources. Anyone of you want to take it? Sir, Finance Commission, uh, while gives a special assistance, uh, particularly non-plan revenue deficit grants, they used to normatively assess the revenue requirements of the states as well as the revenue mobilizations and uh, revenue receipts and where they used to take into account of this both tax and non-tax revenue of the states. Okay, indirectly and, uh, they take that. That's indirectly, yes. So there is, a, there is no direct account, okay, they can see the non-tax and accordingly allocate resources. But for specific uh, grants, non plan revenue deficit grants, they used to assess both uh, revenue mobilization as well as expenditure of the states normatively. Okay, so, so there's one last question, I think. Uh, how Tamil Nadu is managing the in migration and demand for reservation for uh, locals in private jobs by Mr. Shankar Rao? Yeah. I think I'll take that question. Yeah. 
see uh, there is a th th this is linked to a lot of the earlier questions also so first i'll start from the earlier question which professor banamurthy had raised in terms of the traditional industries one of the problems that the traditional industries when i say traditional like textiles and things of that sort is facing a shortage of labor and uh, migrant workers have been the backbone in terms of this kind of industries that we are having uh, what has happened is that this migrant workers there is a, a a a very high level of seasonality in that so there are seasons when there is acute shortage of these laborers so if you look at uh, the textile industry for example we find that uh, there is a huge kind of a shortage of of labor now um, especially when i talk when we talk about belts like coimbatore and tirupur or whatever it is the state in fact has been welcoming this yeah and uh, the state has been in the forefront in terms of providing um, reasonably good accommodation for migrant workers for example i'll tell you one of the recent uh, uh, reforms or the initiatives of the state has been to provide accommodation for migrant workers yeah apart from the one of the <clears throat> largest facilities for women workers which was you know opened in the foxconn factory recently there is a huge migrant uh, workers uh, living complex that was opened in, in sriparbatur yeah. no in ambatur also near the ambatur this is a foxconn thing is in sriparbatur in ambatur there is for migrant workers ambatur has a kind of an enclave which is full of migrant workers so we find that the state has been proactive in terms of you know uh, absorbing this migrant workers to the labor market and this kind of a proactive policy has ensured a frictionless absorption of this migrant workers in terms of the uh, labor market so that is that is something which tamil nadu has been uh, doing quite uh, well i would say yeah yeah so i think um, there's one more last question i think mainly southern indian states are poor performing in non tax revenue what might be the reason it is not only southern indian states almost uh, all the states are poorly performing in non tax revenues and uh, so as we uh, discussed earlier that uh, the, the profits from the public sector undertaking is over the years is declining and performance <coughs> of the public sectors are dismal and besides we can see that uh, wherever the public sectors are not performing the state has to make proper assessment and uh, uh, demonetize those assets and recover and besides uh, states should have proper plan and assess what are the priority areas and what are the additional ser um, service charges user charges they can impose uh, they can levy and they have to properly identify all those areas and as a result what happens uh, they some some additional revenues or actually the scope for uh, non tax revenue is limited but if states can mobilize some efforts some uh, planning then some additional revenue can be generated from non tax sources Yeah, I think one last intervention by Professor Rajendra. Migration. I have uh, two issues to uh, just to point out. Uh, it is not just uh, the migrants are settling down in industrial hubs. If you see the uh, delta during the peak agriculture season, even the uh, uh, male workers engage in uh, transporting the seedlings, paddy seedlings. so that that level it they have gone and uh, also you see the migrant workers in small establishments including tea shops and all hotels etc and uh, of course in the industrial hubs the police department started collecting the identity of so such migrants uh, to just to prevent any awkward incident from either side and the second point is the demand for reservation of reservation for locals in private jobs too i think there is it is a political issue and uh, lot of political parties are demanding for this but from the how far it is possible uh, when we have the right to own assets and uh, also work anywhere in the country as a, a federal uh, state uh, this is more uh, contentious as well as the uh, politically motivated demand that has been uh, making but i think it will take a long term to uh, uh, long time to settle the issue 
thank you yeah, thank you thank you thank you so much we are just at 6 o'clock now uh, let me thank all the three presenters and also uh, participants for raising some very important questions over to you now dr ashok kusandas uh, yes th 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 thank you thank you very much it was such a gripping and captivating discussion uh, we could go on because now it's six o'clock we are already over shots half an hour but i could not uh, uh, feel that we are overshooting so it was such a interesting and uh, very uh, intellectually stimulating discussion it gave every speaker gave a different perspective and complimented each other and that was very wonderful and i am sure like me many uh, uh, participant and the audience were benefited uh, from those very rich quality of the discussions and the presentation and on behalf of uh, egro on behalf of our ceo professor charan singh and on my own behalf i thank you professor bhanu murthy i know how busy you are you still agreed to our request to chair this session professor suresh babu wonderful presentation professor ajendran and professor panda each one of you really enriched our our depth and the width of the knowledge thanks once again and on the next uh, week just a small announcement before we call it a day uh, on 20th that means around the same time next friday we are we are going to discuss very interesting subject that is indo pak war and we are going to see actually 59 years of indo that is that ended on 23rd september uh, uh, in in 1965 and we are going to see on 20th september because we do on on friday and then just uh, a small thing just for the sake of all audience uh, we we finished this war we won this war in 50 days it started on 5th August 1965, ended on 23rd September, actually 50 days. At that time, it, it looked very big for time duration. But if you look, compare it to what is happening in Ukraine and Russia, though they are not comparable, and it looks we, we, we did our job in a very, very sharp. So that is also a measure of productivity. We economists can say whatever job was accomplished, accomplished anyway but the dynamics and other parameters are uh, very different and some are visible some are not but nevertheless it will be very interesting discussion even if we are not economists please join us and uh, regarding today's uh, discussion by tomorrow afternoon our uh, video will be available on our website those who are interested will uh, and this video and other uh, clipping we'll send to all the policy makers like Niti Ayog and other things. We have a standard list and all, all of you. And in fact, it's not a discussion among ourselves, about 100 people. All, all we make it that we, we send the gist of this to, to the policy maker there that really make the uh, fate of this country. So uh, it, they, they may use, they may not use, but at least they are aware of it. So with these things, we call it a day and now we end this report. Thanks once again to one and all, including our participant, including our backend team, uh, Professor Shalini and Professor Vivek. And in fact, everybody had contributed. Some are uh, visible on the screen, some are working behind the uh, curtain. So thanks once and all. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you.